Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to part two of this series on what to do in emergencies. And um, we left off in the middle of talking about fires yesterday. We're going to pick up right where we left off. Uh, but I wanted to show you a couple of things. One, as promised, I went and I found Benjamin. Here he is. He's nice and safe. As you can see, uh, for those of you who attended my first aid webinars uh, a month or two ago, Benjamin was pretty beat up. He had a, like a broken arm and he had, he had gotten something in his eye and he had poison oak and it was pretty rough for him. He is now fully recovered from all of those conditions and um, he has been working hard on his fort out in the woods and he heard that we were talking about what to do in emergencies and he wanted to come and just kind of join the class and listen along. So hi, Benjamin. He's just going to be there. Uh, I also was talking yesterday about a, a smaller fire extinguisher that I keep in my house. I have two of these. This is from, from a company called First Alert. And this is, you know, it, it's a lot easier to carry around than this big guy. And, um, you know, this is great for an office building, for a school, for a hotel, somewhere big, right? But the most likely fire that is going to happen um, in my house is going to be in my kitchen. So I have this there. It's really easy to grab. I have it set not immediately next to the stove. Uh, that way, if something catches fire on the stove, which is where it's most likely to catch fire, this is not then trapped right next to it. I wouldn't, if there's a fire and it's hot, then I can't reach in and grab this. So I have it set on the other side of my sink so that if the something catches on fire on the stove. Again, me cooking those French fries, not very, not very good at that. I can reach over here, grab this, and spray it at the fire. We'll leave that right there. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> yes, I have a bear. Yay, bears. Okay, good. Um. So Isis is asking a question here. She said, in the last webinar, you said that if someone has a, an electrical, uh, the, if someone's getting shocked by electricity, if there's an, an electrical fire, you would turn off the power. What if they are being shocked by an electric, uh, I, you said earbud, I, I think you were talking about car. That, then what do you do, kill it? Uh, please answer, I really wanna know. So if electric cars are, um, they're really cool. I want one. <laughs> They're generally a lot, lot safer than any car that's going to be burning gasoline because gasoline can burn and batteries have a lot harder time burning. It's not made of a, uh, like a liquid that is meant to catch on fire and explode, which gasoline is. Uh, electric cars are, are their own thing. They can have their own problems, but generally they're uh, extremely safe, much safer than any car with gasoline. Um, something would need to go really wrong for an electric car to have any kind of fire happening. It, it takes a lot to break into those battery packages and you're able to get out of the car and get away from it. It's not going to be shocking you like a, like a live electrical wire that fell down from, from the power lines or something like that. It's not going to be that kind of bzz, bzz shock going on. Uh, a battery could catch on fire if it's punctured, if it's poked several different ways and it could burn, but you're gonna be able to get away from that. Okay. Good, um, I'm getting some reports that I'm super glitchy, right? Oh, eel! <laughs> I just said electric eel. Uh, that's a very different situation than an electric car. So now you know what to do if there's a fire around an electric car. An electric eel, man, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't have personal experience with that. I would say try to get out of the water. I'm afraid I don't have much to offer on that. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna continue on with uh, what to do in the event of fires. Uh, my background, I have stormy skies uh, because if we have enough, if we go quick enough today, we're gonna talk about um, tornadoes as one of the several things that we want to be prepared for. All right, popping in to our first aid, basic first aid and emergencies book pack, which uh, again, all of you, when you registered or when your parent 
registered you for this webinar, you or they will have gotten an email with the link to this book and to the learning guide that goes along with it that walks you through it step by step. And um, the link will also be included in the follow-up email after this webinar. And you can always go to heronbooks.com. This is one of the 10 courses that is available for free right now, which is pretty great. All right, last, so uh, the very next thing we were talking about is what if you're inside a building on fire? Okay, here are some points to remember if you have to get out of a burning building. Use the stairs, not elevators, because an elevator shaft acts like a chimney for fire and smoke. Also, the elevator might not work if the electricity goes off. You will see signs next to every elevator. If there's a fire, don't get in here. Use, use the stairs. Try to, avoid, try to avoid inhaling smoke. Stay low and cover your mouth and nose with a cloth or even your shirt or jacket. A saying to remember is stay low and go. Smoke will rise up, you go down, and you can just go under the smoke. So actions. Try to get out quickly. If you have to open a door, check it for heat and smoke first. If the door feels hot or smoke is coming in, don't open it. Get out another way. Um, let's say, let's say this fire extinguisher here is, um, I'm, there's a fire, I'm trying to get out, I'm trying to go that way. There's a door here and this fire extinguisher, like this is the door handle. Instead of just grabbing the door handle and ripping the door open and just going, I, I can stop, I can kind of tap it like this and see, is it hot? Okay, it's actually cool to the touch, which tells me there's probably not fire on the other side. If I were to touch it, it's like, oh, wow, that's hot. Metal heats up really quick from fire and heat. So if I feel that handle and the handle is hot, that's warning me that there is quite possibly fire on the other side of that door and to not open that door. Okay. Let me catch up on the Q&A section really quick, see if I'm ignoring any of you. Uh, if, if you say something or you ask a question or you, if you have a comment and I miss it, I apologize. Sometimes I can't get to them all and, um, and I am aware that I probably need to keep everything moving quickly. All right. What if you're in an elevator when the fire happens? Yeah, so if you're in an elevator, Lorna, that's a good question. Um, and you hear the fire alarm start going off, you're going to want to get out right away. You're going to want to, um, you know, just like hit a button, get the door to open and get out. Um, something I learned just the other day is that, you know, if, if you look at the panel of buttons in an elevator, some of the buttons will have stars next to them. Usually it's, it's the first floor that has a star next to it. Sometimes G, grand floor, will have a star next to it. The star shows that there is a, an exit to the outside on that floor. So you're not gonna see a star next to the 30th floor because there's no exit to the outside on the 30th floor. Uh, first floor is usually gonna have it. That's why it's called the first floor. Um, so that, that's pretty handy. Uh, you're gonna wanna get out right away. Usually if there's, if you're in an elevator and something catches on fire, it's gonna take a little bit for that fire to grow and spread. So you're unlikely to lose your power in your elevator right away. So you'll have some time to Stop the elevator, get out, and take the stairs and get out of the building. <laughs> All right, so I'm just um, catching up here. Uh, Sarah says there are exits, windows, yes, but 30 floors up. I'm not going to recommend using that exit. All right. Um, Good, 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 good. Oh, Alette says some elevators have a fire button. Yes, and you can press that button. And um, some elevators are programmed that uh, when the alarm goes off, it will automatically go to the first floor or to the ground floor and open up. Not, not every elevator, um, th those are just some of them. Okay, so if door is cool, no smoke coming in, open it slowly. If it turns out that there is smoke or fire on the other side of the door, shut it quickly and find another way out. 
Stay low to the floor for fresher air. Cover your mouth with a cloth or even your shirt or jacket. Use the stairs to get out of a burning building, not elevators. If there is a meeting, if there is an outside meeting place, go there quickly. That way, if everyone knows to go to the same spot, then you can, um, you can quickly account for everyone. Here at the school, there's one, when we have a fire drill, a fire alarm, everyone leaves. We, we know where we're going. Everyone has a spot to go to. Okay, all of you are going by the playground. All of you are going by the flagpole. Then we can easily say, okay, there's Timmy, there's Bobby, there's Sally. Everyone's accounted for. Finally, call 911 or your emergency number for help. Uh, good. All right, now, what if you notice a building on fire? You're not inside, you are outside, but you see that building on fire. All right, if you see a burning building, call for emergency assistance right away, 911. Hello, hi, the, you know, the, the Costco is on fire. We need a fire truck. Then you can shout or make noise to get people to come out. Hey, your building's on fire, get out, get out. You'll usually hear the fire alarm going in there, but may maybe, the uh, alarm hasn't gone off. Maybe something was wrong with it. Uh, maybe people haven't noticed. You can yell and say, get out of the building. If you try to go into a burning building to help other people, you can get hurt. You do not want to go rushing into a burning building. We've probably all heard stories about some heroic person rushing in to save their cat or something like that. Um, I cannot recommend that you rush into a burning building or not even rush, just walk slowly into a burning building. That's, that's even worse. Um, let the professionals come. Let, let the firefighters come. They have the equipment. They have the training. They know how to stay safe in there. Um, yeah. Okay, next is water emergency. So that kind of wraps it up for fires. Uh, let me catch up on some questions here. Um, all right, so what if you're asleep and the fire starts? Um, all right, that, that's a great question. You'll notice that fire alarms are really, really annoying. Um, for many years here at the school, we had the bells, right? The bells would ring and that would be our fire alarm. Uh, several years ago, we got a new fire alarm system that doesn't use bells. It uses a high pitch kind of siren, blaring, squeaking, buzzing sound that is, it, it is physically uncomfortable to hear the sound. It's at the same time a really high pitch and a really low pitch and it's buzzing and it kind of feels like it's drilling into your head and through your ears and under your skin. I get shivers when I hear it and I'm like that's really annoying. That's the point point. and they try to make these alarms sound so annoying and uncomfortable that it will wake you from your sleep. So if you're asleep you hear the alarm going even if you're like, you know, it might be a drill, never treat it as a drill. Always treat it as the real thing. Um, okay. Wow, lots of, lots of, um, lots of comments here. I sleep through fire alarms. Is that bad? Yeah, it's not great. Um, I can't say I've never slept through a fire alarm. I have. Uh, you know, I had my air conditioner going and I just didn't hear the fire alarm. I didn't wake up. That's not great. I ended up sleeping with the door kind of cracked after that. And the next time a fire alarm went off when I was sleeping with the air conditioner on, I could hear it. It woke me up. That's good. Uh, doesn't the fire alarm alert the fire department immediately? In many places, yes. In some places, no. If you're, uh, so like here in the building at the school, I know that here at Delphi, and if the fire alarm goes off, I know that the fire department is being contacted automatically. The alarm company sends a signal, it all gets taken care of. If I have something at my house, if the fire, if my smoke detector goes off at my house that is not connected to a central alarm company, it is not connected to any kind of signal thing that would automatically call the fire department, I will have to call them myself. Um, and just assume that a place is not connected to an alarm company and, and that the fire department is not being contacted automatically. It's always, always safer to just call and be like, hey, the Costco's on fire. And the emergency dispatcher will say, thank you very much. We're, we're aware. Help is on its way. Or thank you. We hadn't heard about that. Help is on the way. Um, 
All right, so that answers uh, several questions about, about um, if the fire department is automatically contacted. Um, I spoke briefly yesterday about emergency numbers. In America, it's 911. In the United Kingdom, it's 999. And there's many different systems throughout the world. Uh, someone asked me afterwards yesterday, what happens if you accidentally call 911 or your emergency number? Should you hang up right away? No, 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 no. If you accidentally call it, oh dear, oh, it, my, my phone is calling. I didn't mean to do that. I'm not going to hang up. I'm going to wait for them to pick up. They're going to say, you know, 911, what's your emergency? And I, I will say, I'm sorry, I called accidentally. There is no emergencies. And they will say, thank you very much. And they'll hang up. If you call and hang up, they're going to wonder if you're in trouble. And um, <laughs> they, they might send uh, someone, they might send a police officer to check to make sure that everything's okay. They might try to call you back. It makes their job very difficult. Um, I have a friend who worked as a dispatcher for many years, and she said, always stay on the line, always wait till they pick up and tell them there is no emergency. My phone was in my pocket and I you know, accidentally dialed you. They really, really, really prefer it when you do that. Okay, good. All right, what if you don't have your phone with you and you have to, listen, if you're on one side of your bedroom and there's a fire on the other side of your bedroom and your phone's over there and you just get out and leave your phone, that's the smart thing to do rather than hurt yourself trying to get your phone. Find someone else who's around, use their phone, run to the neighbors. Um, yeah, as long as you get away from that fire and keep yourself safe, that's more important. Okay, good. We are going to, um, we're going to move on really quick. Someone asked what the bear is for. This is Benjamin. Benjamin was part of our first aid webinar several weeks ago, and um, we're teaching out of the basic first aid and emergencies course pack. So those who watched the first aid seminars with that, that I did, uh, they wanted him back and he was happy to come. Right, Benjamin? <laughs> He's so funny. Okay, good. Now, let me pull up here really quick. We talked briefly yesterday. Here we go, here we go. About having a plan for um, getting out of a place. This is a little drawing uh, of someone's house, right? And here is, there's the kitchen and a couple of bedrooms and the den and a living room and bathroom. And you can see there's blue lines showing where there's, blue lines showing where there's windows. And the red arrows show the primary escape path, the first escape path that you're gonna try. You leave out the front door. But notice almost all of these rooms have a secondary escape path, a place that you can go if the first one doesn't work. There's windows in all of these rooms except for the bathroom. So uh, if, there are, if you're in this bedroom here and a fire starts in the hallway right here, you can't follow that red arrow, the fire is in the way, you can open the window, crawl out of the window and escape that way. And then there's a meeting place, meet by the tree in the front yard. Okay, good, so everyone goes. So you can see there's me, there's my wife, my son, daughter, our hamster, everyone's here. Excellent. Um, if you're in any kind of public building, a school or an office building, and especially in hotels, they're all gonna have fire escape plans um, posted on the wall somewhere, often by the stairwells or by the um, elevators, so that you can see what is the route to get out of there if there is a fire, if the fire alarm goes off. I just pulled this off the internet. I, I haven't been to this hotel, but this shows, you know, if you're in room 204, I would expect that if I'm in 204, this is on my wall in my room, and I see I get out of the room, I go to the left, and I can follow those arrows. I always take a moment to find that emergency escape plan if there's somewhere I'm staying for the night, a uh, new hotel, and, and just take a look at it. Where are my exits? Not that I expect that the hotel's gonna catch on fire, not that I expect that I'm going to need to do this, but it only takes a second and it gives me some peace of mind. And like I said yesterday, this can be kind of scary sometimes. Like you're staying in a hotel and the hotel catches on fire, that's scary. If you're not afraid of that, you, you know, it's okay to be afraid of that. But you can take steps to make sure that however prepared you can be, you are. 
And that makes me feel a lot better. I can't stop my hotel from catching on fire, but I know how to get to safety if it does. Okay, let me catch up to some questions here. A lot of people are asking about Benjamin. Yep, good. Uh, what if the fire is on the door and you can't get out of your room? That's why it's always good to have a second escape plan out, out the window. If you're higher up, then um, um, I don't really know what to say about that. Um, we're not going to look at situations where you're totally trapped by fire. We're going to find ways to get out. Um, and the fire department's always on their way. You know, you can cover your mouth with a, with a wet cloth, stay low, stay away from the smoke, and wait for the firefighters to, to come and get you. All right. All right. When I was in a scouting group, we sometimes went to the fire department. Whenever we were there, there was always an emergency. Why? Um, it might feel like there's always an emergency. Uh, where I am right now, you know, we're kind of out in the country and the fire station nearest me services two or three different small towns that are nearby and there's often something going on um, they'll be called even if there's not a building on fire if there's a medical emergency sometimes they'll call the fire department instead of the uh, ambulance if the fire department's closer um, most of the things that the uh, fire fire the fire department will respond to are not huge emergencies you know we hear the that joke about firefighters helping rescue cats from trees. If that's all a firefighter does in a day is rescue a cat from a tree, that's a good day. We would rather not have a bunch of emergencies. Um, our windows have mosquito nets. Should I just try to break it open? Uh, yeah, open the window, open the glass part. You don't want broken glass. And then just, you know, push or kick that mosquito net out and climb out. Yep. Um, oh, Dora. This is a really good question. What if you have a dog or a cat? Should I rescue them in a fire or leave them? Okay, so this is a part that's a little bit more difficult to talk about and it's definitely sad. If you have a dog or a cat, or I, I mentioned in my example that our pet hamster, Daisy, you know, I'm like, hey, everyone's here. Um, if there's a fire and your pet is not with you, do leave them. Do wait for them to come out to you. Um, you know, if a firefighter comes by and asks, uh, firefighter is going to ask, is there anyone else in the house? You're like, no, all the people are out here. My dog Toto is in there, but we didn't go back in for him. And the firefighter will say that was smart. And then if it's, if it makes sense, if it's safe for them, they'll go in and try to try to get your dog or your cat. Um, but do not go in, do not go back in after the dog or the cat. You have to protect yourself first. It's sad, but necessary. Okay. Oh, Things got a little bit sad, but we're gonna be okay. If I'm a dog and something's on fire, I'm gonna try to get out of there. So I, I'm gonna count on, on my pet to, to, uh, to try to get out. Okay, good. All right, we're not gonna talk about that one yet. All right, the next um, item that we're gonna talk about is a water emergency. Okay. Scroll back down, I changed the zoom. Rescue from water emergencies. So situation, person in trouble in the water or drowning. All right, here's what to do. Call for help, tell the lifeguard if there is one. Have someone call 911 or the local emergency number because the person will need medical help after she is out of the water. Reach, try to reach the person with your hand or foot. If you're on the side of a pool or on a dock, lie down flat. First, this is so you don't get pulled in when the person grabs onto you. They're gonna grab, they're gonna pull hard because they're freaking out. If you're in the water, hold on to something solid like the pool ladder or the edge of a dock and then reach for the person. You can also reach with a strong pole or a broom. Um, a lot of pools and stuff like that will have things around the side that you can reach, long poles that you can reach in, they can grab it and you can pull them back. Throw the person something that will float, like a lifeguard ring, a life jacket, or even a foam cooler. It is best to throw something that has a rope attached that you can pull on after the person is hanging on. Go. You should then go to the person with a boat or surfboard. Uh, you could go to the person with a boat or surfboard if that was the only way to get help. 
get medical help for the person right away, even if it looks like she has recovered. Um, yeah, so so this thing where it says, don't just jump in after the person. Uh, I, I made that mistake when, when I was younger. Um, we were swimming in the pool and my friend was having trouble and I went over to try to help them out. And they were, we were still learning how to, to swim. And the lifeguard, I didn't see that the lifeguard was already coming. They were already on their way. They spotted the trouble before I did. And they were coming with a, with a foam floaty thingy to help my friend out. So I went over to help my friend out, not following the specific advice that I had been given earlier in the day. And uh, my friend kind of started to push down on me, trying to get up and get air themselves. And I was getting pushed under. The lifeguard was there in like two seconds and <laughs> lifted his both up. And I kind of got a talking to because I wasn't following the rules that I had been given. So they mean it when they say that there. Okay. Uh, ba -ba -ba. If you don't know how to swim, I really suggest taking lessons. Uh, summer's coming. I, you know, hopefully things are going to continue to open back up and in a, in a safe manner. And when you can, do take swimming lessons. It's really, really good to know how to swim. And it's better to know how to swim before you need to rather than learning after you needed to do it. Yep. Okay, good. Now, what if the person has fallen through the ice into freezing water? I grew up in Michigan and we get cold winters there. And, um, you know, the ponds and rivers would freeze over a lot and stuff like that. And I would never go walking out onto the ice unless I knew that it was nice and thick and not going to crack under me. But what if a person has fallen through ice into freezing water? Ice that is not fully frozen can crack and a person walking on it can end up in the water. Walking over the ice to help a person who has fallen in can be dangerous since the ice could break under you too. So what do you do? Here are the actions. Try to reach the person from shore, solid ground, or give her something to grab onto from the shore, such as a stick, broom, or rope. You can tie something to the end of the rope and throw it to the person. If that doesn't work, lie down on the ice to reach the person. This spreads your weight, so the ice is less likely to crack under you. Once the person is holding on, you can pull her out. If you are grasping her directly, hold onto her by the wrists to pull her out. Like this, you see people do this in movies sometimes. This is a nice, this is stronger than holding hands. You can both grip tightly, and even if the other person isn't gripping tightly, you can grip them pretty strong. After you pull the person out of the water, get her out of wet clothing, dried off, and warmed up. It doesn't say there to call 911, but definitely, definitely, definitely call 911. Definitely. Um, good. Okay, let's see if there's any questions about that one. Uh, let's see. Oh, Milo says, from experience, if you don't know how to swim very well, don't go into the middle of the deep end. <laughs> That's right. Stay where you know that your limits are. I'm a pretty good swimmer. I know how to swim. I've been swimming since I was five or something like that. But I also know when I go to a pool, I'm not going to go deep into the deep end uh, after I've been swimming a lot and I'm getting tired. Um, you know, I'm not going to go swimming out in the ocean. I, I know my limits and I stay within them. <clears throat> All right. Lorna says, yeah, with ice, lay down and spread your weight evenly over the ice that you're on. Yeah. Yep. Um, even you're, though you're putting the same amount of weight on the ice, if you're spread out, it's a lot better than if you're, you know, on one or two feet, because that way it's all the weight pushing down on one bit. And that would be more likely to crack it. If you're spread out, it's less likely to break. Okay. Uh, oh, some people asking about a couple of particular movies. I am not familiar with those movies, so so I, I can't comment on that. <laughs> Akanksha says, technically, there is no middle of the ocean. That's very true. You're all there's always some direction towards land. Yep, there you go. All right, great. All right, we're gonna move on here. Tornadoes, earthquakes, floods, and storms. This is all kind of crammed into one section here, but I'm going to take a little bit more time on each one because um, um, 
you know, I haven't had to deal with anyone falling through the ice before. It's not a situation I've encountered, though it definitely could, and it's good to know what to do. Um, and it, it's also kind of fun to watch movies and to see things that happen and to be able to analyze like, ah, that person made, made a mistake. That wasn't very smart. Um, so, and you can learn through uh, stuff like that on movies and TV shows to figure out what to do and what not to do. Oh, don't go running into that burning building to get your, to get your phone. Leave it, you know, you can always get a new phone. All right. Uh, some of these though, I have a little bit more experience with it. So a tornado, I'm gonna pop over here really quick. Uh, this is something called a funnel cloud. It's a cloud and it looks like a funnel, kind of like a funnel that you have, might have in your kitchen for pouring liquid into, into something. And it's wider on the top and more narrow on the bottom. And uh, this is kind of a blurry picture. It was taken farther away. But what this picture doesn't show super well is that this cloud is not just kind of starting to poke down like that, but it's also spinning. It might be spinning pretty fast, might be spinning only, only a little bit, but it's that circular motion. That is a warning sign. That is a baby tornado. Um, this looks very, very similar to the funnel cloud that I saw myself oh, eight, nine years ago or something like that. Um, I recognized it in the sky and I said, uh-oh, I called 911 <laughs> and, um, and the operator, I said, uh, you know, they said, you know, operator or emergency services or however they greeted it. And I said, yes, I think I see a funnel cloud. And, and the operator said, yes, we're aware of it. Are you calling to report any injuries or damage? I said, no. And they said, okay, thank you. And they hung up and he was talking really quickly. And I could tell that he had been getting a lot of calls about the same thing. He talked very quickly and it wasn't that he didn't care about what I was saying. It was that he probably had many other phone lines going and it was a team of operators answering these phone calls. And he asked, are there any injuries or damage to report? If I had said yes, he would have stuck on the line with me, but I was no longer the emergency. I was satisfied that they knew what was happening. And uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Aubrey asks, are we going to escape with Benjamin? Uh, nope, I, um, I think that Benjamin and I are gonna stay here. If the fire alarm went off, I would uh, quickly end the webinar, I'd grab Benjamin and we would get out and go to the assigned meeting place so that we could tell everyone that we were safe. And people would say, James, why, why did you bring a teddy bear? Okay. Um, when did you see a funnel cloud? Yeah, I saw it uh, about eight or nine years ago in the summer. And I grew up, so this is how a, uh, a baby tornado, a funnel cloud could look. Um, you've probably all seen pictures of an actual tornado. Um, the light looks really weird in this one. And sometimes the light looks really weird in tornado weather. I grew up in Michigan. Uh, let's see, did we get a map of it here? Yeah, I grew up in Michigan, over right around there. And it's on the edge, as you can see, kind of close to a spot uh, where tornadoes are more likely to happen, definitely more likely than happen in Maine or in California or where I am now in Oregon. Um, this is a map of where in America tornadoes most likely happen. And the red bits are the, are the spots that have the most tornadoes. That area right in there, um, kind of uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, that place is known as Tornado Alley. That's the section of the world, the section of the United States that gets more tornadoes than anywhere else. Tornadoes do happen outside the US. Uh, here's a map of everywhere that they are likely or more likely to occur on the planet than other places. But three out of every four tornadoes happen in America. Uh, most of the world doesn't really get them. All through Central Africa there, tornadoes aren't really a thing. Um, South America, most of Russia and most of China and India, tornadoes don't happen in a lot of places. America just kind of lost the geographical lottery the way the geography, the way the land in America is shaped is, it's, it, 
it's perfectly designed to create lots of tornadoes. So that's what happens. You have cold air coming down from Canada and from the Arctic. You have warm air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico and they collide on these nice, perfectly flat, open Great Plains. And uh, that's the recipe for tornadoes. So I grew up in Michigan over there and we had tornado sirens. Uh, many of you probably living, watching this webinar, living in an area where you have tornado sirens. And you'll hear a loud siren go off outside and that's signaling there has been a tornado spotted. Um, where I was growing up, they only sounded the siren <clears throat> if they knew there was a tornado. They can see it on the radar, <clears throat> they can see it in the weather, and there's someone that called and confirmed, like, I see a tornado or I see a funnel cloud that could instantly turn into a tornado. And when that alarm goes off, you get underground. Um, you, you get to shelter really quickly. We'll talk about what that means. Uh, where I saw the tornado, now tornadoes could happen anywhere on earth. And where I did see that one tornado, I went my whole life without seeing a tornado in Michigan. I was ready for it. We had the tornado siren go off two or three times a year. I knew what to do. We got into our basement and got into our safe spot. I didn't actually see a tornado with my own eyes until I was living out here in Oregon. And I, and I was driving along and I saw something that looked like that. And then uh, I, I was in my car driving along. I kept my distance. I stayed far away from it. And I, I could see where it was going and I just let it go. It was you know, like a mile away or more. I did not get any closer to it. I stopped and I let it go until it was gone. It ended up being a very weak tornado. It touched down um, and damaged the roof of one or two buildings. And that was about it. Uh, most tornadoes are very weak like that. They're not going to create a ton of damage. But, you know, when they do touch down, they can be pretty destructive. Now let's find out what to do when you see one. All right. People are saying, all right, Gavin said they saw a funnel cloud. Yep. Um, Ice is asking, what if you don't have a storm cellar? We're definitely going to cover that. Aubrey's in California. Uh, Aubrey, you're unlikely to encounter a tornado. That's really good. It's good to know what to do if there is one. So if you travel to a tornado area and it happens, you know what to do. Evelyn lives in Tornado, in tornado Valley. Okay. All right. Okay, so many questions. All right. Um, I am going to move on to what do you do if there is one? Here we go. Situation, tornado. Either you've heard the siren go off or you saw one yourself. Um, all right, go to a storm cellar, a basement or an interior room on the lowest floor. A storm cellar, uh, some houses, especially houses built in areas of the United States that are known to have a lot of tornadoes, will be a cellar, a basement room in your house that is designed to protect you in the case of a, of a tornado. It's usually dug kind of deep um, and it's a good way to get out of the wind, get out. Of, even if the tornado comes and hits your house and blows a bunch of stuff away, you're going to be down under the ground and the wind, you know, the wind's blowing around up there, but you're down in a hole and you're more protected. Not only are you more protected from the wind, you're protected from the debris, from all the broken bits of the house and trees and stuff that are flying around in that tornado that's what's going to hurt you. And so you, you want to protect yourself from the flying things. The wind creates those. So uh, basement, the bottommost floor in the building that you're in, go there. Let's say that you're in a house that doesn't have a basement. It doesn't have a storm cellar. Um, there's places in the United States where they know that tornadoes are likely to happen there, but the ground is is it, it, it's made in such a way that you can't really dig a, a basement. Um, so what you wanna do in those places, if there's no basement, you go to the bottom most floor in the building, if there's more than one floor, and you go as close to the inside, as close to the center of the building as possible. Find a room that does not have any windows to it. 
no windows to the outside. You want to put as many walls between you and the outside world as you can. Uh, oftentimes, this is a bathroom. Bathrooms are, if it's on the inside of the building, no outside windows, pretty great shelter spot. Other times, it's going to be a closet or something like that. What if there's stuff in the closet you can't fit in? Open the closet, grab the stuff, throw the stuff out of the closet. You can clean it up later, get in there, and shut the door. Um, all right, if you're outside, lie down in a low place on the ground. Again, there's you want to protect yourself from the wind and from the stuff flying in the wind. Get low. If there's a little ditch or something like that, get down in that. Cover your body and protect your head, and then stay there until the tornado is over. Uh, protect your head. If there's a pillow that you can grab, grab that pillow and put it over. Um, and it kind of like um, you've you might have heard, get into the tub and cover yourself with a mattress. If you have, have time to do that and grab that, great. As long as that bathroom is the most inner room in your house and there's no windows to the outside. If you're in a bathroom with nice big glass windows so that you can like enjoy the view, you know, as you're taking a bath or something like that, you don't want to be in there. Glass is bad in a tornado. Um, but you, there's been plenty of stories of people will get in their tub. It's a nice strong tub. It will shield you from stuff coming in from the sides. And you pull pillows or a mattress over and you hang on to that. It shields you from the stuff that's flying around. Okay. Oh, Evelyn's in Southwest Kansas. <laughs> that is the heart of Tornado Alley. Um, yep. Let's see. Lots of questions. I'm sorry that I don't have time to get all to all of these. I'm going to pick just a few here. Um, <clears throat> Isis is asking, how long do tornadoes last? Uh, the one that I saw myself lasted maybe 30 seconds. Um, other tornadoes have lasted upwards of hours. It's really different. Some are huge, you know, like half a mile wide and they last a minute or two. Others can be small and last for a long time. It's really random. It's really hard to predict exactly what a tornado, how big it's going to be, where it's going to go, how fast it's going to move, how quickly it's going to be spinning. Um, so even though they can they're a lot better now at predicting like, hey, in 15 minutes, we could have a tornado here. Uh, it's hard to say it's going to hit this house, but it's going to miss that one. Uh, if I'm outside, should I hold on to a tree trunk? No, thank you. Get down. Get down low. If there's roots sticking out and you can get between the roots, you know, get as low as you can. If there's any kind of ditch, get yourself in there and cover up. Uh, let's see, if there's a tornado, can I go under my piano? Um, I wouldn't go under a piano. Pianos are often on wheels that can move around. I wouldn't want that piano to get pushed by the wind and kind of run into me. Um, try to get into a smaller, more enclosed room, like again, a, a small bathroom, a closet inside without outside windows to it. Um, Oh, Evelyn's asking, is a smaller big space better? Small space, definitely a small space. Less stuff to pick up and throw around. And, um, and hopefully it'll, it'll you know, hold on a bit better against the wind. Okay. How fast does it spin? <laughs> um, yeah, some of these tornadoes can spin really fast. Those winds will be going hundreds of miles per hour, like 200 miles per hour. Pretty intense, powerful uh form of nature yeah okay um i am afraid that i don't have a ton of time to go over the rest of this um we're gonna pick up tomorrow we're gonna be talking about earthquakes i can tell you all about those and we're gonna talk about that for a bit um all right get under a table getting under a table is definitely better than just being in the middle of the room uh, you know, if it's, you want to protect stuff from falling on you, you want to protect stuff from blowing in and hitting you. Under a table, if I'm in a room and I can't get into a smaller enclosed closet or something like, getting under a table and holding on, you know, that'll protect you from stuff falling down. That, that's definitely better than being in the middle of the room without anything um, over you. Okay, um, I am going to have to end off today. Someone asked, um, 
Uh, what if the tornado picks you up? I am afraid I can't help with that. Um, yeah, I don't know what to suggest there. Curl up into a ball and land on something soft. Yeah, that's, that's tough. Okay. What if you don't have a room in the middle of your house? Isis, that's a really good question. Uh, when we're done here, in just, in just a moment, yep, we're out of time. Um, take a look around your house. Find the innermost room. If every room in your house has a window to the outside, I would say find the smallest room with the smallest window. Again, that might probably be the bathroom. Um, or find a, if there's a room that has a window, but there's a closet inside, the closet's where you're going to want to go to. Uh, if it's anything like my closet, it's full of coats and clothes and stuff like that. And hey, that's great protection. Stuff flying in through the door, it's going to hit the coats, not going to hit you. Pull those coats down, cover yourself up with them, use them as padding, as a, as a shield. Okay, everyone, I have to sign off. Thank you so much for joining me. I am back for part three of this. this is going to be first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, 9 a.m. to 9.45 a.m., and we're going to cover earthquakes and a few other things. Thank you for uh, learning with me and for going through this adventure together, and I look forward to going over the rest of it with you tomorrow. Okay, let's get to the final slide here. Yeah, you, see, you, you can see I've got other slides ready. <laughs> All right, bye everyone.